Wow. Stop running. There's a bounty on me. Did you know that? And there, there we go. All right. So I'm going to pull up the syllabus. Let's see. I haven't done sharing screens before. So let's see. Share screen. I want to PowerPoint. No, I don't want to PowerPoint. I'm looking at my slides. Okay. So do you see the syllabus? Yes. Okay, cool. Very cool. I'll make that big. All right. So I don't see the syllabus hmm? anymore. I don't see the okay, there we go. Now you now you I see it. it. Yeah. Okay. So the syllabus and the CID are the same as ter in terms of schedule. And basically all the wording and stuff is the same, but we just have to have that mm -hmm. um, that in there for you. So are you a maid? What's your major? So I'm a psychology and sociology major. Okay. And so I need this course when I want to go into for social work for graduate school. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, class is supposed to meet from 8 to 925 every day. Um, Zoom okay. meetings, we're going to do Zooms every Wednesday. Um, and then on, on exam review days. And so okay. all of that is in the schedule for Zoom days. And so we'll meet at, at, between one or two, at least twice a week. I'll probably add some extra days in and announce them mm -hmm. um, just to kind of help people stay on track and take attendance and give you some points for being here. Okay. So you get points today. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> so do you have the textbook? Uh, is it the one online that they sent, I believe? Yes, I think you yeah. can get it online. Are you yeah. taking lab as well? Yeah. Okay. That's all online through Labster. Um, and I have all the links there for you on Canvas. I don't know if you've been on Canvas at all yet. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to look into Canvas right now. Okay, no worries. Um, so you can look through the course objectives and learning outcomes, um, but we are, this is just kind of a broad class um, over the main biological concepts, not um, super in depth about any one thing, but mm -hmm. I think that you'll be able to learn a lot and come out with a good broad knowledge that will help you as you continue on with school. Okay. Um, so course requirements. So here we have um, the class and lecture schedule. Please note that there are specific days for quizzes. Mm -hmm. And this is my way to help kind of make sure everybody's staying on track and not getting behind in their material. So that actually the first quiz is tomorrow. It's due tomorrow. Okay. And it's over the first chapter. And the first chapter is not very long. And um, we'll go over that together today. So we'll just be able to do that all ourselves and too bad for the other students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording this, so I think I can upload it. So oh, okay, yeah. They can watch it later. That's my hope anyways. Mm -hmm. So all homework assignments and labs are due at the end of each unit. Okay. And so the due dates are right down here. So you can see those. So classes start May 27 and closes June 5 for the first section. Okay. So the first section is the biggest. It's four chapters. So mm -hmm. we have a little bit more time um, and three quizzes, whereas the rest of the sections, we just have two or one quizzes, one quiz and the last one per section. Um, and Zoom days are down below at the base of the schedule. Okay. So right there, Zoom dates. So these are every Wednesday and every exam review day we have a Zoom. And as I mentioned, we'll probably make sure to add another Zoom so that you have at least two Zooms a week. And I'll do some lecture, but part of it is for question and answer time so that you- So will we be doing our lectures on our own then? We'll, we'll do some lecture together and then the rest you will do on your own. Okay. And I'm recording lectures through PowerPoint. Um, some of the files are really large, so I'm trying to break them up and upload it, but it's taking a long time. Right. You have to view it in PowerPoint to get okay. the audio and the video. Okay. So just so you know, chapter two 
has been uploaded already and that I just did audio and drawings and stuff because it's over chemistry. So there's mm -hmm. no video for that one, but I'm going to try to make sure there's videos for all the rest as much as okay. I can. It's just, they make huge files. Right. It's hard to upload. Okay. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I will keep attendance. Like I mentioned, I'll, I'll have some in-class assignments that I will assign and Every Zoom day you get credit for being there. So it's really important to, to come to those so you mm -hmm. get credit and you're able to ask questions. We're able to do lecture together and get some of that face-to-face that -face class time that's really important. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's gonna be four exams for this course <clears throat> and it's only gonna be on new material each exam. So it's not gonna be comprehensive at the end. Okay. You don't have to worry about that. There will be a quiz over almost every chapter, and those are outlined in the syllabus up above in the schedule. So you have specific quiz dates. Mm -hmm. They're not done at. The, they're not due at the end of the unit. They're due during the during, session. Okay. Yeah, so really important to stay on top of that. So lecture grade is seventy five percent of your overall grade, and your lab grade is twenty five percent, and that's just automatically calculated in canvas which is really nice oh, that's so really nice. Have a good idea of what your grade is at the time okay. oh look at that that doesn't look good it's all by itself can you see me editing yeah oh, okay <laughs> i was curious <laughs> okay um so expectations there it's i try to modify them for studying at home and class at home um but it is important to come to class when it's scheduled. Um, when we have Zoom meetings, it's important that everybody keep their phones on silent and are trying to pay attention and be engaged. Asking questions is totally welcome anytime. So I don't think I'll be able to see people like raising their hands. So if that's the case, you can just speak up and I'll answer your question as soon as I can. Okay. Okay, so participation is really helpful and it's great for your learning. Okay, completing assignments and labs and quizzes on time is going to be a big boost to your grade. So make sure you keep track of those dates and mm -hmm. plan accordingly so that you are able to do what you need to do. Okay, if you need to drop the course, that the date is put into Canvas. I believe it's, I wanna say, drop with a refund, I wanna say is by the 29th of May. So it's, okay. pretty, it's pretty quick. Yeah. But <clears throat> if you wanna withdraw, that's, I also put that date in Canvas for you. Um, I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but it is in Canvas. So mm -hmm. check that if, if anybody is wanting to withdraw, check for the withdrawal date or contact me and I'll get it for you. So you can do that before you or you receive a failing grade if you don't want to complete the class. Okay, so mastering biology, you will do your quizzes and exams and homework through mastering biology. Have you um, signed up for that? I have not. I just got an email about the book this morning. Okay, oh yeah. really? Yeah. So do your best to sign up for that today. Get on okay. there because your first quiz is due tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. I'll yeah. Make sure that it's posted. Um, I'll have to check that after we talk today. But so you want to make sure you get on that right away. If you experience any trouble or you can't find the quiz, then just let me know. Okay. I'll be trying to check my email multiple times a day to keep track of everything. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so for Mastering Biology, you should have received an access code. So you'll use that code to access this specific course. Okay. And the course ID is right there in red, um, but it, you have a direct link for it on Canvas, so you should be okay. Um, I will close this. Yes, save my changes, thank you. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay, so what do you see now? Nothing. <laughs> you don't see anything. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. 
I will switch to chapter one PowerPoint. Um, tell me if you see it. I see the PowerPoint now. Okay, perfect. So we are just gonna get into it. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Give me one second, I'm gonna close the door. Okay. Okay, so we're just gonna go through chapter one lecture and I'm gonna move my computer so I can do this easier. All right, so just a little bit about me. Um, I have my PhD in biology. I studied the California condor for my PhD and I, I had a blast doing it, learned a lot <laughs> of cool stuff. So my, my area of expertise is animal behavior. So. Mm -hmm love animals, just fascinated by their behavior, and it's, it's what I do, what I love to do. Um, I've taught at many different colleges, including Southeast Community College. I taught um, general biology last fall, and I've taught at Union College and two different colleges in California. Mm -hmm. So I am a California native. I moved here about 10 years ago now, which is amazing. Still haven't adjusted to the winters. Oh yeah, I bet. No, not a fan of the winters at all, but we're tough, we're tough people, so we can handle it. Yeah, I my full-time job, I work at a company called NTT Data, and I'm an adjudicator, which is basically, I work with medical insurance claims, mm -hmm. and I um, examine medical claims and make a decision whether or not we can pay somebody or can't pay somebody. Mm. So it's, it's kind of a neat job. I'm able to stay up on my medical terminology and knowledge and help people by being able to pay them in their time of need when they're sick. So mm. that's, that's kind of nice. And my son just passed sixth grade, so mm. he is now a seventh grader. <laughs> So we're in junior high now, which is yeah. crazy. So that's part of my life as well. Okay, so moving into chapter one, this is just an introduction to science. So first, it's just kind of a reflection or kind of to get you thinking question. So if you were a future explorer and you found a planet during your voyage that had conditions favorable to life, you're taking samples and they're small, they're microscopic, but you get interesting results. So some that have regular shapes that are, there are patterns in them. Mm -hmm. So based on that, how would you determine if these objects were alive? I guess really look into like, just kind of up, like observe them okay. and really, like study them for a while just to like see if they are alive or not. Okay. What kind of characteristics do you think would be important to life? Um, would oxygen be one kind of? Yeah, that, that does play an important role in cellular respiration. So um, carrying out those internal functions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is kind of just a repeat of what I asked you. So what properties would you require before you were willing to say it was alive? So, hmm. yeah, we're going to go over what biology, the characteristics that we set aside as being important for life. So that's kind of our first section we're going to talk about. Hmm. So the actual definition of biology is the scientific study of life. And so we look at life through several, uh, I think it's, I can't remember how many properties, through a group of properties that are shared by all living things. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna go through those things together. So we would consider an organism alive if it displayed all of the properties we're gonna talk about. Not some, it has to be mm -hmm. all of them. Okay, so properties of living things, reproduction. All organisms reproduce their own kind. So an elephant reproduces and produces another elephant, not a cheetah or a zebra. Mm -hmm. Dogs produce other dogs. They may be different species or hybrids, but they're still always dogs. Okay, the next is growth and development. So in our genes and our genetic material, 
all the information is carried in that genetic material and it's passed on to the next generation and it controls growth in organisms from the very beginning when you're a single cell zygote to when you become a full-size elephant it controls the growth okay i have a quick question for you i wonder yeah. can i draw can you see that yeah i can see that oh okay cool all right <laughs> this is my first zoom class so i just want to make sure oh, okay, these yeah. are all working together so yay okay so the next property is energy use so every organism is going to take n energy convert energy and expel energy. And in chapter four, we talk about that, those processes. I'm in the process of studying to record chapter four, because mm -hmm. yes, teachers study their own lectures too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, order. Every living thing has a complex structure that is well organized. And so in this picture here, the illustration is the eye of the elephant. So every, every illustration that we're having when we talk about properties of living things, we're just using elephant as our example. The okay. eye is very ordered, very complex. And so that allows it to have its specific function. Okay. Another really important concept is cells. All living organisms are made of cells. And this is a really important concept and this is actually called the cell theory which we'll talk more about later mm -hmm. but it, all organisms are made up of cells if it's alive it's cellular so you can have just a single celled organism or an organism with trillions of cells like the elephant but they're all made up of cells so an important thing to remember, and you'll probably see this on a quiz or an exam, almost in the exact wording, but the cell, ooh, there's somebody else coming in. The cell is the fundamental unit of life. Okay, so we're gonna make sure we remember that. Let's see, um, hello. Hi. Oh, hello, welcome to class. All right, so we are just started chapter one and we're going through the lecture. We already went through the syllabus, but I'm recording this lecture, so you should be able to get the full lecture later. So welcome to general biology. Okay, so more properties of living things. The ability to respond to the environment or to respond to stimuli. So Organisms respond to changes in their environment. So in this picture here, we have an elephant cooling itself off with water. So mm -hmm. if it gets too hot, it can make a behavioral change to reduce its temperature. And then, so that is a response to the environment. So what's also really neat is many organisms are able to control their internal body temperature, for example, or their internal environment within a very narrow range. So for example, we are, our body temperature, the average is 98.6. It doesn't vary very much. If it does, we get sick or we right. are sick. So we regulate our internal environment very carefully and closely. So even if it's hot, our body temperature stays the same. If it's cool, our body temperature stays the same and we make behavioral changes to help keep it in that range. So when it's cold, what do we do? We, we get really cold and sometimes we get sick. We get sick, but what do we do to help maintain our body temperature? Oh, we shiver. Tend to, yeah. What was that? Shiver. We shiver, yeah, very good. Um, shiver, we seek a warmer, like we go inside if we're outside or we put on extra clothes. Those are all responses to our environment. Okay. okay. So, and then evolution, so individuals, okay, moving your picture there, um, individuals that have traits that allow them to survive and reproduce in their current environment, pass those beneficial genes on to their offspring, which gives them an advantage um, as they are in that environment. And these passing on genes for those particular traits drives evolution of certain properties over time. 
So for example, elephants, modern day African savanna elephants are ancestors of the woolly mammoth. They have genes in common. Okay, so thinking about the characteristics we've just discussed, let's learn about a virus and see if we can determine if a virus is alive or not. So here are some facts about viruses. A virus cannot reproduce on its own. And a virus is not made of cells. So do you see any problems right away? Yeah. Yeah? What do you see as a problem? That it's not able to reproduce, nor does it have any cells. Yep, exactly. So non-living organisms or non-living matter, it's not an organism, non-living matter can have some of life's properties, but remember you have to have all of life's properties to be considered truly living, mm -hmm. okay? So for example, viruses show order. Um, they have the ability to evolve and adapt to their environment, but it does not, or viruses do not have all of the properties of life. So they don't have cells, they're not made of cells, and they cannot reproduce on their own. They rely on their host cell for reproduction. So because of this, we do not consider viruses alive. Okay, so we can study life at many levels. Oh, there I have, wait, can I get videos of everybody? I'm trying to figure it out. Yes, I did, okay. Sorry, I'm still learning. <laughs> the only Zooms I've done before were Zooms with family. Okay. So, because we've had a lot of birthdays in the last two months and a lot of Zoom meetings for birthday parties over online. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been different. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. How are you guys doing with the whole pandemic? It's different for sure. Yeah. I'm just going to classes. Yeah, I, I understand that that would be challenging to do your classes all online. So, whoops, let me back up. Okay, so when we study life, we can study at many different levels. And so we're gonna look at all the possible levels that we can study life with, starting from the most simple, I mean, not sorry, starting from the most um, complex. Do you guys just see PowerPoint or do you see video as well? See video too. Oh, you do? Oh, so I need to keep that up. Okay. I wasn't sure if I needed to keep the video screen up. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, starting from the most broad level would be the biosphere. And this is all living things on Earth. And so you can study life at the biosphere level. It's going to be very broad, not specific. If you move to a little bit more specific, is ecosystem level and this is made up of all living things and non-living things so all you know trees and plants and organisms but also the rocks and the weather and the water are all taken into account at the ecosystem level oh, I need my screen. okay then we can study life at the community level and this is made up of all the interacting populations in an ecosystem. So we could say that the prairie is an ecosystem and we could study life in the prairie, the interactions between the birds and the snakes and the insects and the lizards, that would be a community. Um, if we wanted to look at a population level, so in this illustration here, we're looking at elephants, um, population level, we're looking at a group of interacting individuals of the same species. So that's much more specific. So we're looking at the group of all of the elephants and studying their population level. We can go even more in depth and study at the organismal level. And this is looking at individual living organisms. So for example, the research that I did with the California condor was on the organismal level because I was studying their behavior. I wasn't studying a population, I was studying a small group, but that would be at the organismal level. You can go even more in depth 
<clears throat> and start studying at the organ system level. And this is basically an organ system is a group of organisms, sorry, a group of organs that work together for a specific function in the body. So in this example we see here with the elephant, we're looking at the circulatory system, which it comprise the heart and all of the vessels in the body. We can get more specific than that and study at the organ level. And so an organ is made up of many of different tissue types and they all cooperate together to perform a specific task. So in the case of the heart, all those tissues, the muscle tissue, the epithelial tissue, the connective tissue, all works together to pump blood to the rest of the body. Even more specific than that, we can study life at the tissue level. And this is a group of cells that are similar to each other. So all, all epithelial cells, for example, um, they all work together for a specific function. And so in this illustration here, we're looking at um, uh, endocardium, which is epithelial cells that line the inside of the heart. And it makes a nice smooth, slick surface for red blood cells to pass over and so they don't burst, and that's really important. Okay, then we can look at the cell level of life. And remember what I mentioned before, the cell is the fundamental unit of life. So nothing smaller than a cell can be considered alive. Really important to remember. Then we start looking at structures inside the cell. And so an organelle, and the best, easiest way to think about this, organelle means little organ. And so it's like these are little structures inside the cell that perform specific tasks, just like each organ in our body performs a specific task. They're like little organs, little organs for the cell that each have specific jobs. And in chapter three, we talk about some of those specific functions of organelles. Okay. Smaller than that, a molecule, so going to chemistry level here. A molecule is a group of atoms that are bound together with chemical bonds. So that's all about chapter two. So we have to understand chemistry, which we're gonna do. We have to understand that to understand the rest of biology, the rest of the basis for life. So chemistry is important. And then the last level or the most exclusive level is the atom level and the atom is the fundamental unit of matter. So we had two things that were kind of fundamental units. We had the cell being a fundamental unit of life and then we have the atom being the fundamental unit of matter. So whenever we say something's a fundamental unit of something, you wanna remember it. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears and start talking about the scientific method. Are you guys familiar with the scientific method at all? So Leslie says yes. I can't see Nate yeah. though. Yeah, you are too? Okay, cool. So at the end of this lecture, you will have an in-class assignment to take care of. And it's based on the scientific method. So I, it's usually, I think it's a fun ex experiment to do. You're, you're running your own kind of scientific method experiment. So pardon me for a second, I need my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, so thinking about the scientific method, we're gonna have ask a couple questions here. So cookies, are all chocolate chip cookies the same? What do you guys think? No. No. Do you like some chocolate chip cookies better than others? Yes. Yeah. How, how do they differ? What makes a, a cookie good? Consistency, they can be different textures. Okay, that's true. I, for example, prefer homemade cookies mm -hmm. over store-bought cookies or even from the bakery because they just don't taste the same. Yeah. But that's just my preference. So everybody kind of maybe gauges how a chocolate chip cookie, for example, would be better or not, but how do we determine what makes a great cookie? How can we say one cookie is better than another? So 
to start with that process of kind of determining how do we define that, we start with observations. So in the science, scientific method, scientists learn about the world around them, the natural world by making observations. They take measurements and they gather data. But the very first step in this whole process is making an observation. It could be that the cookie's consistency is dry and crumbly and I don't like that, maybe. Okay, but that's an observation. When you make an observation, it leads you to asking a question. So if I say the cookie is dry and crumbly, my question could be really simple of, well, why is it dry and crumbly? So it's almost rewording your observation, but you're rewording it in the form of a question. But forming that question is really important in the process of the scientific method. So in this example we're talking about here, <clears throat> the observation could be that some cookies are better than others. So what makes a cookie better than other? That's, my, that's a question right there. So after you form a question, you can, you, the next step is the hypothesis. And the hypothesis is, I like to call it a testable statement. Um, the definition in the book says, and a proposed explanation to the question that can be investigated, which is kind of really wordy, I think. I like, I like it being testable statement. So you make a statement that you can test. You can make an experiment with it. So observations and experimentation are used to investigate your hypothesis. So if I say that some cookies are better than others. My question could be, why is cookie, why is this cookie so much better than the other cookie? I can form a testable statement and say, um, co the cookies cooked with butter have a better consistency than cookies cooked with margarine. That's a testable statement because then I can go in and create an experiment and test the difference between butter and margarine. Okay, so looking again at our example, what makes the best cookie? You can form a hypothesis. So in this example, switching from butter to margarine will improve cookies. That is a testable statement. You can directly test that with an experiment. So the scientific method is a series of steps that are followed in order. It's really important to follow them in order that provide you insight about the natural world. And so we see this nice diagram here that shows you the steps of the scientific method. And this top one up here, um, you can't see the part because we're our pictures are covering it, but there is a form of biology that is just kind of re revolves around making observations. And that's Oh, what's it called? Oh, I had it in my head. Discovery science. It's called discovery science, where you are making new discoveries and making observations and writing those down. And then if you want to go further, you can form questions and make an hypothesis and test it. But with discovery science, you just stay in that observation loop. Which would be cool to be a discovery scientist to find new species, for example, and describe them. That would be a great example of discovery um, science. So in the real world, however, the scientific method is not always nice and perfectly linear. Um, so it's, it's important to keep that in mind because you form a hypothesis here you develop an experiment and you perform the experiment, you get results, and based on your results, you can form conclusions. You can say, um, switching to margarine made better cookies, then that supports your hypothesis. But if your cookies turn out worse, your conclusion is switching to margarine doesn't produce better cookies. And that can lead you to forming a new hypothesis, to form a new test, so you can go through loops all throughout the scientific method that leave you to different steps that you need to do. Oh, I don't have the book right here with me. Um, hold on one second, I'm gonna get the book.
Okay. So if you have your book, or you can write this down if you want to look at it later, there is an illustration on page seven that shows kind of what happens in the real world with um, the science in action. And so you can end up with um, arrows taking you all over the place. So take a look at that when you get a chance. Okay. What is the difference or what is a theory? Okay, so in the scientific method, a theory is based off of lots of experiments and is pretty well substantiated with evidence. It's not a law, which is like the law of gravity. Every time you drop something, it's gonna fall. <clears throat> a theory has been tested time and time again, and you always get the same results. And so it becomes a theory. So a good example is the cell theory that all living organisms are made up of cells. And so far, every time we've tested this or checked, the living organisms that we found are made up of cells. And so that falls, it, it allows us to create a theory that says that all living organisms are made up of cells. It's well substantiated. Okay, so think about the word theory and how we use it in everyday language. Does it differ with how we use theory in scientific language? Do you, have you ever caught yourself using the word theory before? Yeah. Yeah? Doesn't mean the same thing really. No, it really doesn't. So you could say, let's say the dog ran out into the street. And you can say, oh, my theory is that he saw the cat across the street. Well, is that really a theory in scientific terms? No, no, it's speculation or conjecture. It's not the same, it's not the same validity as we would have for theory in scientific terms, which important to remember a theory scientifically it means it's well supported it has testable ideas and you have objective data that supports your theory so if we're talking about the cell theory for example it's well supported every time that we've examined this living organisms are made up of cells you have testable ideas and your data is objective which means you should not contain bias in it so the theory has a very specific meaning. Okay, so when we are doing experiments, which is part of our scientific method process, there are different ways to do your, your, different ways to conduct your experiment. So in a controlled experiment, a test is run multiple times and only change one variable and keep everything else constant. So for example, in this illustration here, it's talking about two batches of cookies, one with all-purpose flour and one with cake flour. You could run a controlled experiment and only change one variable, for example, the flour, and keep all the other ingredients and quantities the same and see what your results are, see if you get a difference. Okay, so that is an important aspect of a controlled experiment is only modifying one variable so that you can actually determine if there has been a change. Okay, so in, in experiments, you have a variable, you have multiple variables. So this is any factor or trait or condition like flower type that can exist in different amounts or types. So this it talks about, let's say, all the ingredients on the cookie list are variables. What variable are you going to modify to test your experiment? Oops. Okay, sorry. Um, so an experiment usually has three types of variables. You have your independent variable, your dependent variable, and your control. And so we're gonna talk about what each of those are. So independent variable is what is being manipulated as the potential cause. So 
in this example, your independent variable can be the flower because you're changing flower types to see if that changes your cookie, okay? The dependent variable is the response to the experiment or the output. Um, so we're looking at what is the effect of changing the flower type on cookie? Does it change the, the height of the cookie or not? Make it more raised or not? So that's the dependent variable. That's your outcome. The control variable is something that is constant. It doesn't change. So control would be staying with the exact recipe and the flower that it calls for. That would be your control because that would mean no change has occurred. And that allows you to see if your dependent variable has really changed or not. Okay, so a control group is really important in establishing a good experiment. And there are different types of control. You can have a negative control, and this is where there is no change. You don't expect any change in that group. So for example, sticking with the original recipe, that would be your negative control. Another example would be taking your cookies from a 375 degree oven and moving it into another 375 degree oven. We wouldn't expect any change because the temperature stayed the same. So that's another example of a negative control. Positive control is a group where you do expect a change. Um, <clears throat> so where you have made a change, like you change the flower, that would be a positive control. And we're expecting to see a change in the dependent variable. So an example would be doubling the amount of butter or changing the type of flour. We would expect to see a change. That would be a positive control. Okay, also in experiments, we use what's called a blind experiment. And this is used to help produ uh, reduce bias in experiments. And this is where information is withheld from participants. So if you're being asked to test or determine if cookie A or cookie B is better, you don't know what they did to the cookies. That would be a single blind experiment because you're the participant and you're judging the cookies, but you don't know what they did to the cookies. In a double blind experiment, the, the experimenter who's, who's running the test doesn't know what was done to the cookies either. And that helps reduce bias even further so that the experimenter doesn't unconsciously convey um, a bias to the participant. So that would be a double blind. And so double blind experiments are considered the hallmark of experimentation because it reduces bias as much as possible. Um, you guys have heard of the placebo effect before? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so the placebo effect or using a placebo in experiments is used to determine if a particular, say we're testing a medication, if the medication actually has an effect they'll have two groups, one group with the placebo, which sometimes is usually it's like a sugar pill, they refer to it, and that doesn't have any medical benefit that we know of, and then the, the medication that we're testing. You have two groups and you give one group the placebo and one group the experimental drug. And you should be able to get a pretty good idea on if that drug works or not, because the placebo group, they're receiving a medication too, as far as they know, but they don't know what kind of ex uh, outcome is expected. But with the placebo effect, people can sometimes think that they're feeling, getting a benefit from that medication when it's really, there's none at all. And so it's kind of a psychosomatic thing with the placebo effect. Okay. So this is kind of related to what you're going to do for your at-home homework assignment today. And so this is just a quick question to think about. Two, two different battery types. Which battery lasts longer? That's a question. That's part of the scientific method. And so 
what would be a hypothesis, you two, for which battery lasts longer? What is a testable statement you can make? Duracell lasts longer than Energizer? Yeah, exactly. That's a testable statement. So you could run experiments on that. So you can, what would be, if you did an experiment, well, first of all, so you, you make a hypothesis. The next step is designing an experiment that will answer your question. So your homework that you have to do is a scientific method experiment. And I want you to make observations about the natural world around you, what's going on in the house, what's going on outside. Find something that triggers your interest, that makes you think about a question. Okay, it can be anything, like why does the dog like sleeping in a box? That's a question. <laughs> okay, that's something you can test. My dog likes sleeping in a Costco box. He's a nut. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you di design an experiment. And I have specific instructions for this I'll post on to Canvas for you. Um, identify what the control group is, what the dependent variable is, and what the independent variable is and what kind of data you would expect to gather. You do not have to run the experiment, but it's just a simple kind of going through the steps of the scientific method in your everyday world. So be creative, have fun with it. And I will again post this on, I wanna say Moodle, but it's Canvas. I will post this on Canvas for you with all of the instructions. And I want it to be posted as a thread to the assignment. So respond to the assignment and that's how I'll be able to grade it. Please don't email it to me. Respond directly on Canvas to the assignment. Okay, that way I don't lose any assignments and everyone can get a grade. So look for that later today. If it's not up right after class, it'll be up this afternoon. And I know you guys have plenty of stuff to worry about today to get done. So. Just make sure you check by 5 p.m. that your quiz should be up because your first quiz is due by tomorrow and your scientific method experiment assignment is up. And you, you'll be able to see that in your assignment section. Okay. Spend a little time checking out Canvas and make sure you find everything you need to find. Okay, so keep that assignment in mind and we'll keep talking about doing experiments and doing science. So scientific thinking, using the scientific method is a way to view the world that's different than other ways to view the world. Scientists view the world differently than someone who's not a scientist, who hasn't been trained to view it in a particular way or to follow the scientific method of experimentation and finding out new information. So it is one way of knowing and understanding the world. Um, there are hallmarks and limitations to science. Science can't study certain, certain things because they can't be tested in the scientific method. So, um, hot topic. Uh, this is why we, oft, we wanna separate science and religion, for example, is because we can't test things in religion. Those are beliefs. They don't, we can't test it with a scientific method. So that we, that's outside of the realm of science. So that would be a limitation for science. But so there's specific guidelines that we have to follow. Pseudoscience is any field of study that basically falsely presents itself as being scientific. Um, but it cannot be studied using the scientific method. It doesn't follow the natural way of thinking in science. Can you think of any examples of a pseudoscience? I'll give you some on the next slide. So here are some examples of pseudosciences. Um, the top one here, looking at the shape of the head, determining the character of a person, determining how they'll behave or how they think based on the shape of their head or the measurements they make of their head. I think this is the 
used to be called or is a study called phrenology, which is was a long touted as a scientific way to understand people's behaviors and um, personalities, but it really doesn't have a scientific basis at all. Um, tarot reading, the same thing. Um, you can look at the, the, the pigeons here, talk about different types of pseudosciences that we can't test with the scientific method. Okay, so this table is in your book. Um, you can refer to it, let's see, on page 10. And so it just kind of gives you, breaks it down, features of science versus features of pseudoscience. And so it really clearly delineates some of the reasons certain pseudosciences can't be considered science. And so following the scientific method is very well recognized as being part of science. If you can't follow a scientific method, it's probably not science. Okay, you get repeatable, predictable results with science. And with pseudoscience, it's not the case. Usually it's based off of a few stories or a few studies of like one person. Um, and it's based on opinion, not data that's gathered. Um, I'll let you guys look through the rest of these, but there are great examples of the difference between science and pseudoscience. Um, so biology is limited to the study of life through following the recognized scientific approach, through following the scientific method. That is how biologists are able to understand and study life. Okay, part of the scientific process depends on peer review. So I don't know if you've had any other science classes yet. Anybody? Mm, no, Nate? Been a while. You? Been a while, okay. So one of the things that's often done in classes is their students are told they need to use peer reviewed journals or peer reviewed um, data to back up what they're talking about. So when we talk about peer review, this is when other scientists that are knowledgeable in a field review the research you've done. They're not involved in your research, so they're not invested in it, but they're experts in the field and they review your research to determine, was this a valid experiment? Did they follow the scientific method? Did they have results that are meaningful? And so this is one way to validate the experiment or the research that's been done is by using other peers to review your work. Um, I went through this peer review process when I submitted a journal, submitted an article to submission, can't talk, sorry, submitted an article for publication. They send your paper off to experts in the field who review your research and make a recommendation based on their opinion if it should be published or not. I was, I was lucky they agreed that it should be published, so I published a paper. If you ever want to look it up, it's in zoo biology. It's a while ago. <laughs> um, so, but through doing peer review, you're getting the validation that your research follow the scientific method, that it's something that should be shared with the rest of the scientific community. So keeping that in mind, there are two basic sources or types of sources of information or um, so the primary source would be original material, like a journal article based on the particular research. And it has, it's just pure research. A secondary source basically summarizes original material. So summarizes primary sources and adds commentary in. And so examples would be Wikipedia, for example. They're using primary sources, but they add in their own commentary, which I'm sure you've heard before from your professors that Wikipedia is not a good resource to use because it's not a primary source. 
and it can be because it has personal opinion and commentary in there it's something you should not cite mm -hmm. so when you're doing assignments or research in science you want to use primary sources for your for your research purposes okay so if we look at this graph can you determine which cookie is a winner, is a clear winner, just by looking at the graph? Cookie A. Cookie A? Why do you say that? Because it has some more votes. Yeah. So we look at the y-axis, <laughs> and this is number of times chosen as a winner. So it looks like 85% about. Cookie B looks like it was chosen about 15% of the time just by looking at the graph. We can see that one was chosen as the winner much more often. And so using graphs and tables gives you a really good way to visualize your results. It kind of summarizes it into a neat little table or, or illustration. So we're going to go over what a table is and what graphs and different types of graphs. So a scientific table is a really efficient way to present a lot of data in a small space. Um, let's see, page 12 has a good table for you to look at, and I'll show it on the next slide. Graphs are ways to display data visually that helps summarize and compare information. So if we go back to looking at here, this is a graph that we're looking at. And it summarizes information really simply, visually, so we can look at it and go, oh yeah, there's an obvious difference there. There's a clear winner. Okay, so here is the illustration of the table. And again, this is on page 12. I'm not gonna go over this whole thing. But note, you have a lot of information in a small space. And so this is just, this is summarizing cancer cases, different types of cancer between males and females and new cases and deaths. And so you can look at, let's say we want to look at lung cancer, for example. This is along basically the X axis here. We can see these are new cases and, and deaths for males and females across the table. So it gives you a kind of a quick and dirty way to view the, the results. Okay. Graphs, on the other hand, they are the graphs you can find on page 13 when you're if you're looking later are ways to present your data in a easy visual way and there are different types of graphs so we have a line graph right here this is used to show data that changes continuously so if we look at the x and y axis the y-axis is deaths per 1,000 Americans. And so that's a continuous um, string of numbers. If you look at the x-axis, those it's our dates. So it's over time. And both of those are continuous. And so you would have, for example, multiple plots all throughout, and then you draw a line and attach, connect the dots. It gives you a nice way to kind of view the data. In this one, we have two lines, one for men and one for women. The one on the top is men. The one at the bottom is women. You can look at that and get a pretty quick summary, or let's say I ask, um, males are, between males and females, who has the higher rate of lung cancer deaths? Can you tell by looking at the graph? Males. Yeah, males, because the graph, the, it's higher. Okay, so it gives you a really easy way to summarize the information. If we look down below at the bar graph, this is used to compare categories of information. So compare the differences between males and females, for example. Or in this example here, it's comparing treatment types. Um, was somebody treated with just drugs, chemotherapy, which is in blue, or treated with drugs and radiation? That's in red. And it's looking at survival rates. So 
what kind of summary can you make from this graph? What kind of conclusion can you draw? Drugs and radiation together are have a better survival rate when treating lung cancer. Yeah, very good. Very good, well said. And then if we look at the two major categories, less than 70 year old and 70 year old or greater, you can see that the difference between the two gets a lot smaller. So the survival rate is better if you're young and you have both treatment types. So it just gives you a really easy way to summarize information in categories. Then you can also use pie charts, and this is just looking at parts of a whole. So everything is represented as a percentage, and it all makes up a full circle, which would be 100%. And so you're looking at parts of the whole. Um, and so I know part of this is covered here, but it says how far lung cancer is spread at time of, I don't know, at time of something, at time of diagnosis. Okay. And so it's talking about metastasis which is how far it's spread from its original spot in the body. And so you're saying, okay, some of over 50% metastasized far away from the lungs. Some are just metastasized within the region. Some are local and some we just don't know, but they're all part of the whole, the whole group. Okay, so kind of have summary time now. What are some things that all living things have in common? So they have to, um, oh wait, never mind. <laughs> Characteristics of life. So they have, they have to, to reproduce. Reproduction. Oh, yeah. Good. They have cells. Cells. Energy? Yes. So they take in energy, they convert energy, and expel energy. Yes, very good. So those are some examples that living things have in common. Now, question is, how do living things differ from each other? So some living things have only one cell? That's true. Yeah, that's true. Some living things are made up of just one cell. Some are made up of many, many, many cells. That's one thing that's different. Very good. It's kind of get you thinking. So if we think about the themes in chapter one about biology and how we organize the world, it's going to really help you as you move forward in general biology. It makes sense of all the information that you learn. Sorry, so for evolution, we talked about, so if we're just, I'm gonna use the book for a little bit of this, because this is on page 15. So if we look at evolution, talk in terms of elephants, okay? So zoologists have been able to study the evolution of African elephants and actually discovered using genetics that there are two species of elephants, the African savanna elephant and the African forest elephant. I think that's what it's called. Yes, African forest element, elephant. And so those have changed over time in the study by using genetics, we're able to see those differences and actually create two separate species. Structure and function. So if we're thinking, if you remember back, we were talking about organ system and organ and we talked about the heart. So for in elephants, the heart weighs over 40 pounds, which is really big and really heavy. And the interesting thing is it's huge, but it beats at half the rate that our hearts beat. So it beats much slower than ours does. And that's something that's different between organisms could be how fast the heart beats, okay? And so something to keep in mind, information flow <clears throat> this is just looking at how genetic information is passed from one generation to the next. So if we're thinking about these elephants again, they have genes in common with their ancestors, the woolly mammoth. So they have genes in common, but it changes over certain genes 
are expressed over time and you end up with a new species. Interconnectedness, um, this is looking at the interactions between, let's say, elephant and other organisms that are in its area, interactions between the elephant and non-living things like soil and water and weather. Um, so all of those factors are interconnected with the life of that organism. And then energy and matter pathways. So here's just an interesting fact. The elephants have to forage constantly throughout their day to maintain 70,000 calories, which is just to maintain their body weight. Um, and remember with energy and matter, organisms take in energy, they com convert the energy to something they can use, and then they expel energy. And so we'll talk about this in chapter four. Okay, so quick review on some things, and this one is a little close to home. Um, evolution, and this is basically descent with gradual changes over time um, to kind of express different characteristics over time. So thinking about antibiotic resistant bacteria, little changes in the bacteria over time help it become more resistant to a particular uh, antibiotic, which is not good. That antibiotic resistant bacteria is a problem now. In, in, bleh, I can't talk. It's a problem in science, a problem in medicine. Um, and so this illustration, don't let infection get under your skin, telling you how to care for it properly is something that is important helps re prevent or reduce um, antibiotic resistance. What's one thing you guys can do to reduce antibiotic resistance? You know? Let's say you get sick and your doctor has prescribed you antibiotics. Do you take all of them? No. Or do you stop when you feel better? Stop when you feel better. That leads to antibiotic resistance, girl. Yeah, so if you don't completely kill them, you have some that are left over that were resistant to the beginning of the, that antibiotic. And those are the ones that are gonna continue to live and pass on that trait to be resistant. So that can build up antibiotic resistance. So you want to always take all of your antibiotics. Yeah, a lot of people just don't do that. And it's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> that's your... That's your the part you can play in helping to reduce antibiotic resistance. Okay, all right. In biology, the structure of something, how it's built, the shape, and its function in the body provide insight to each other. And I'm gonna see if I can write this without messing up. Structure determines function. Okay. And in anatomy and physiology, this is an overarching theme. I know we're not in anatomy and physiology, but it still holds for us. The structure of something helps determine its function. So they give you insight into, if you're studying the structure of the lungs, it's going to give you insight into how the lungs work. Okay. So energy transformation, this is chapter four, big time. But this is part of um, what we find or one of those overarching themes of living organisms is the ability to transform energy. So for example, the sun provides energy that drives pretty much all of the ecosystems on earth because it begins with the energy from the sun converted to chemical energy in plants, which is then consumed by consumers like um, primary consumers who eat plants or predators who eat the consumers who ate the plants. But all of that energy originally is derived from the sun. So it's kind of cool. It drives all the interactions. Okay. So information flow. This is talking about genetic information and how the genetic information, DNA, 
is common in all organisms. All organisms use DNA or RNA um, as their chemical coding system. So it's in common with all living organisms. Um, so for example, you can pass on traits, you can pass on genetic disorders or diseases from a mutation in that sequence. So a couple examples, um, Parkinson's disease, two people here, Muhammad Ali and Michael J. Fox, um, both have Parkinson's disease and it's a result of a mutation in the DNA. Okay, looking at interconnectedness. So there are many interconnected connections within and between different levels in the biological systems. And so this is like, this is talking about ecology, how organisms interact with each other, how they interact with other organisms, and it's all interconnected. So when you study each level, let's say you're studying at the organismal level or the organ system level or the population level, you will find properties that were not there in the preceding level. So for example, if I'm studying organismal level, I'm gonna find out more about that organism studying it than just its population, which is the higher order, okay? So as the complexity increases, you find more properties. So as you get more complex, you go from organism to organ system to organ, you find that things get more complex and you find out more properties of that living organism at each level. And that is the end of our, our slide, our slides. So let's see. So do you guys still see me? Yeah. Okay. Still, still feeling out Zoom. <laughs> See, so, oh wow, we're done with our time for the day too. Very good. Well, I'm really glad you guys joined for Zoom today, joined for class. You will get credit for being here today. Check later on today, make sure you get your quiz, make sure your quiz is available. If it's not, email me right away and make sure your scientific method experiment assignment is there as well. If not, email me right away. Okay. Okay, make sure that stuff is set up. I think it is, but I just make sure it's visible to you. And um, let's see, let's, let's, I'm gonna check the syllabus really quick before I let you go. Oh, did I close it? I may have closed it. Okay, never mind. We won't worry about that. So is there any questions about today or anything I've talked about? No, not really. Can't think of anything. Okay, good. Um, I was going to check the schedule to see when our next Zoom date is, but it, I will make sure it's posted with a link. Um, Zoom times will always be 8 a.m. because that's what time our class is supposed to meet. It's from 8 to 9.25, so we went a couple minutes over. I apologize. But we got chapter one done and under your belt, so that's good. Um, I will see you guys on the next Zoom meeting. Please make sure you check your announcements daily because I will add extra Zoom meetings that are not on the schedule. So to make sure that we get plenty of in-class lecture time as well. Okay. All right. With that, I will let you guys go. Thank you so much for joining today and welcome to General Biology. Thank you. See ya. All right. See you soon. Bye.